Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, hey, man, good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? Yeah, cool. Hey, um, message is not going to be 20 minutes. It'll be a little bit longer than that, okay? So I just want to let you know. We're starting a new series this morning called Real Relationships. And uh, we uh, have been working on this for the last couple of months. I've been really excited to get to this series. In fact, I announced two weeks ago we were going to be starting a new series. And uh, I forgot I had one more message before we got to this one. So, uh, you know, I, I love story. I, I, one of the things we've learned around Summit is everybody loves story. We, we love the fact that uh, we can enter into into people's story. And so as we start this series, I, I want you to watch this story real quick. One of the lies that I believed growing up is that I wasn't anyone until I was married and until I was a wife and until I was a mom and until I had a family. And I questioned and I doubted God's goodness for me. I grew up in a Christian home. I'm actually the daughter of a pastor and had always desired to be married and to be a wife and a mom. Um, so I did get married kind of right out of college and married my college sweetheart. And we were together for about 11 years and then I got divorced. Um, so that was devastating. As my divorce was being finalized, I felt totally lost. I think I was listening to friends, I was listening to movies and TV telling me that the best way to get over a divorce would be to go out and party and to do things that I now regret, um, but it seemed to be the right thing to do at the time in order to just move on and to heal from that relationship so that I could really get into the next one. And many years passed and a lot of questioning of, okay, God, I don't understand what's happening here. I mean, you're the one that put this desire in me and yet, where's the guy? What, what are you doing in this point in my life? And it took many years for me to realize that I had a plan and I was asking God to join me in my plan versus asking Him what His plan is for my life. And I think once I kind of figured that out and realized that my plan wasn't working and when I surrendered everything to Him, absolutely everything, that was really the turning point for me and just saying, okay, Lord, I don't know what you have planned for me, but I'm gonna believe and trust that it is way better than anything that I could plan for myself. And I'm trusting that you have my best interest at heart and that this is gonna be a really good life. Because I didn't believe that for a long time. Probably the biggest thing that I have learned is just how much God loves me. And I think he's remarkably patient with me. And I do think that I have much more of a confidence in God's plan for my life. And I feel like that has given me patience, just really trusting that He knows what my next steps are and that what I'm surrendering to Him and I'm walking that path, that it will be good. So I think that's where my patience comes from now, is just really trusting that His plan for my life is the best plan. We love a good story, don't we? We love a good love story. Because there's something in us, I think if you really were honest, there's something in us that that's our greatest need, is that we won't love. We're looking for love. And, and when you look around the world around us, we understand that culture, everything in culture is a story of love. In fact, ladies, do you remember the very first time you saw the movie, The Notebook? It was a moment, wasn't it? Right? 
I mean, because you're like, dude, that's real love right there. Or how about Sleepless in Seattle? Remember that one? Yeah, or you've got mail, right? The whole Tom Hanks catalog, you know? And, and we understand it when we see it, don't we? We know what love is. And, and men, on the other hand, we love a good love story too, but it has to be the right love story, right? Gladiator, right? <laughs> Braveheart, the Patriot, Armageddon, Turner and Hooch, come on, yeah? Yeah, see, there's something in it that, that there's, there's a line of love in every story that we look at. And that's why we love them and, and we gravitate towards those things and that love and those things we, we enjoy. In fact, you remember growing up as, as children, we would watch those Disney movies. Every Disney movie had a story of love in them that, they, that, that the prince comes along and rescues the princess. And we love that. And, and here's what we learned from a very early age from watching Disney. Disney movies to now watching The Bachelor, because nobody watches that in here, but um, uh, reading those novels and all the stuff that we do now is one of the things we know. We know there's a difference between fairy tale and reality because we know that in every relationship that we're seeing in our culture, on TV, in fairy tales, in that leaves us short of what real meaning and real love is. Because here's what you start to do, and here's what we do when we begin to believe the fairy tales is we begin to measure every relationship and we're let down in the reality. And reality can't quite catch up. And so this morning we're gonna be looking at some love stories. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some love stories. And it doesn't matter if you're married or you're single or you're single again or single, single, single again, 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 or you're looking to get married or wanting to get married or you're thinking about it. Uh, my prayer is that we'll approach this because what we're going to be talking about is not just married people, not just single people, not, not we're, we're, I, I believe that when we come to church, we begin to ask God, God, would you show us a fresh word? And he's faithful to always do that. And so if we're going to talk about relationships and we're going to talk about love, we got to go to a passage that's pretty stinking familiar. In fact, it's the most famous passage. I'm going on 31 years in ministry. I've done a lot of weddings, amen? And it seems like every wedding I do, almost every one of them, they always want this passage. In fact, you don't even have to be a believer. And you've probably heard this before if you've been to enough weddings. If you're watching on television this week, you've heard this passage. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Anybody ever read it? Amen. So we're going to define love by what Scripture says about love. So let's read it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not proud, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now, that's a lot to live up to, amen? I mean, you read that, you hear that, you probably had that read at your wedding, you heard somebody else read it at their wedding, and, and you go out and you start living that, and you can just live that out perfectly, right? Anybody? No, it's impossible, isn't it? And you've probably never heard somebody say that from the stage at church that, that that's impossible because there's only one that can live that out perfectly and his name is God. And we'll talk about that later in the series. But see, when we look at this and we look at this passage and over the next few weeks, we're gonna break this down. We're gonna talk about how we can take this passage and apply this to our relationship. So I wanna talk about the first three words and it's called love is patient. I remember when I was in college, I started praying for patience. And I went and told my pastor, and uh, Jimmy Barksdale at the time was my pastor, and I was young, and he's, oh, oh, no, Edward, do not ever pray for patience. Because God will give you a lot of opportunity to be patient, amen? But yet scripture says love is patient. So what do we do with that? You see, love is patient. The problem is we are not patient, right? Love is patient, I'm just not. And so we weigh this and go, okay, I'm not supposed to pray for patience because God will give me an opportunity to be patient. But you know what? Honestly, the longer I live, I'm pretty patient. Until you get stuck on 14 at I-20 at the Love's truck stop and you get behind that truck and then you're late for work in Tyler. Can I get an amen? 
Let me tell you what you don't do. You don't get behind that truck. Oh, Lord, thank you so much that I can be behind this truck this morning. You are such a good God to give me such a great gift to spend this time behind this truck. God, you're so good because nobody ever prays that, right? Because we're just not patient, are we? It doesn't matter how good you are. There might be somebody in your life that is testing your patience. Now, don't point to your spouse and don't point to the person next to you because that'll get you in trouble, right? And you'll need counseling. But we have those people that test your patience, right? Because love is patient. We're not. You might even get upset with your internet speed while you're watching Apple TV or Netflix because we live in Hawkins, America. Amen? Because we're not patient. I think we'll all agree that at certain points in our journey, um, we struggle with this. And so, therefore, what we've done over the years is we just shy away from it because somebody told us a long time ago, don't, don't pray for patience. So, we just stay away from it. You see, the English language is a beautiful language, and I love it, and, I, I, and we all speak it, and some of us speak it better than others, so don't critique me and don't send me, you know, you English majors and all that, because I speak redneck English, okay? And so, uh, but one of the things about the English language is it falls short when you look at the biblical text sometimes. For instance, there are many words in the Bible for our one word in English. Let me, let me give you, and this is love. I love Danielle, my wife. I love her. We're going on 18 years of marriage, and, and it just, it's amazing to me that, that every year gets better, and it really does. And this is where I always get in trouble in relationship series, because I usually take this too far. Y'all know I love this woman. I'm telling you, it's, it's incredible, and I don't want to get in trouble, because last time I did, everybody got mad and sent me emails. Anyway, I love my wife. I love fishing. I do. I love fishing. I love steak. I, I'm, I'm telling you, medium rare. I love steak. Amen? Anybody else? I can eat it every day, you know? It's amazing. But let's be honest. We all know that when I say I love my wife and I love fishing, my love for fishing and my love for my wife, they're not equal, right? We know that, don't we? Right? Don't come up to me afterwards and say, I don't know about you, bro. I know. They're not equal, okay? They're not, babe. I promise you. See, there's many words for love. There's also pictures for, for patience this morning. And so I want to look at it this morning because I want to look at it in two different ways. Number one, circumstantial patience. And number two, relational patience. And they're different. They're different. Uh, circumstantial patience is what we see in James chapter 1 when James was writing that we're to endure suffering, that we're to press into that, to have endurance amongst trials and tribulations because life's going to happen. And so he encourages us to endure when that happens, when that comes along. And so that's a circumstantial patience. But what we see in 1 Corinthians 13 is not circumstantial, it's relational. It has to do with towards a person, a relational love towards someone, not a circumstance. To demonstrate this, it's interesting in Exodus chapter 34, God kind of shows us this about himself. When, when the children of Israel came out of bondage and Moses was leading them across the desert, they came to this point where God invites Moses up on the mountain and God's going to give them the Ten Commandments. And these are going to be these Ten Commandments that are going to define the children of Israel as God's people. And it was going to set them apart from all the pagan uh, cultures around them, that the Ten Commandments was going to define them and who they are. And so Moses goes up on the mountain and God invites him there. And and then God descends from a cloud and, and uh, gives him the Ten Commandments. But before he does, he says this. Look at it, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. It says, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate, and this is God talking about himself. The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God. Everybody say slow. slow. Come on, say slow. slow. Slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations. Forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. So when God says about himself, he's demonstrating to us, when he says, I'm slow to anger, that same word slow in the Hebrew is that same word in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 of patience. It has the same connotation that, that this whole idea that in this patient kind of love in the midst of a relationship. And basically what God is saying to Moses, he says, look, man, I'm going to patiently endure my people. Because don't forget in Exodus 34, when God invited Moses up on the mountain to give him the Ten Commandments, you remember what the children of Israel were doing at the bottom of the mountain? They were building an idol, a golden calf. And so it's interesting that in the moment of that, God says, I see your weaknesses. I see your addictions. I see everything about you. I know what you're doing. I know you're inviting me to, my, to your plan when you need to be getting in on my plan 
saying, but listen, I already know what you're doing. I know everything about you. And he says, oh, by the way, Moses, what I'm saying to you, I already know what they're doing down there. And so basically, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to patiently and slowly love you. I'm going to endure. In fact, theologians call this whole idea that God is long-suffering that God's going to long suffer. He's going to lean into you, knowing all of your junk, knowing all of your stuff, knowing all of your weaknesses, knowing what you're doing right now and even what you're thinking right now, that he's going to long suffer with you, that he's fully aware of who you are. He's fully aware of who you are, and yet he has the ability to withhold what we deserve. Isn't that good? That he withholds that. His love is patient. It's a persevering love. It leans in. And some of you are here this morning and you're going, well, God can't love me. And there's no way because God, God there's no way God can love because you don't know what I've done. And yet the amazing thing is, is, is you, you think God is, is just fed up with you. You know, can I just say this to you? He's not fed up with you. He's long suffering with you. Amen. He's long suffering with you. And that's good news that he's long suffering with you. So what's that look like in relationships? Because, you know, that's God, right? And God's the one that does that purpose. So how do we do that, right? If, 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 if we're going to talk about real relationships and this could change us, then where does this love is patient thing come in? And so what I want to do over the next few weeks is we're going to talk about each of these, still, uh, these things in 1 Corinthians 13, but then we're going to go back to the Old Testament and we're going to grab a story. And so this morning, as we're talking about love is patient, I want to go back to Genesis chapter 29. We're not going to read the whole passage today because the Super Bowl this tonight. I don't want some of you to get nervous that you're not going to get home in time, but it maybe before the Super Bowl starts, you'll go home and read this. It's a story of Jacob and Rachel. And if you don't know that story, kind of let me give you the background. Jacob was a son of Isaac and he was a twin. He had a twin brother named Esau. Their granddad was Abraham. If you know who, who, who that is, you know, so this is a pretty important dude in all of our lineage. And Esau was the oldest of the twins, which meant in that culture, when you were born first out, and so he He's the oldest twin, um, that he then had the birthright, which means he gets all the inheritance and his brothers and family and everybody submits to him. And so you can kind of catch what's going on here. So Jacob uh, found a way to steal the birthright, okay? And so Jacob steals the birthright and robs him. And you can just imagine what that did to Esau. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Jacob and Esau. You got Jacob, who's kind of a mama's boy, and you got Esau, who's a manly man. Right? You know, he's just a he's that kind of dude. And so you got Esau in skinny jeans and V-neck shirt. You got you got Esau on this side anyway. Um, and so you got the, the, these two pictures. And so so when when Jacob stole Esau's birthright, Jacob's ticked. He said, I'm gonna tell you right now, when dad's dead, I'm gonna kill you. So his mama came to him, mama's boy said, I mean, you gotta get out of here, your brother's gonna kill you and all that stuff. So we pick the story up and he goes out and he's going east and he's going to stay with his mom's brother Laban and um, he's gonna, you know, his dad said, go marry your cousin, Arkansas. Anyway, um, you know, and so you can't make this stuff up. I know, I know, our youth pastor's from Arkansas um, and they're not brother and sis, maybe. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> no, they're not. Um, so he goes out and he's on his way and he's get, he comes to this field and he comes to this field and there's a bunch of shepherd boys there around this well and, and, and Jacob's going a long way and he gets there and he's, he's, he's thirsty. And so he's having this conversation and you get the picture here, okay? Don't miss this in scripture. You can't make this up, all right, okay? And some of you don't think the Bible's true. I'm telling you, this stuff you can't make up. I mean, if I was writing the Bible, I wouldn't put some of this stuff in here, especially what we're fixing to get to in a minute. And uh, it's almost X-rated what we're fixing to get to. So just relax and don't write me an email yet. Um, so they're standing at the well, they're having this conversation and off in the distance, he sees her. It's Rachel. She's a shepherdess and she's a tough, tough broad, I'm telling you, because she protects the sheep. And so here he is, he's talking, he looks like, ah! and Rachel's coming across the desert and her hair is flipping. If I had hair right now, I would flip it, you know, and the sun is glistening behind her and Jacob's like, ah! Oh my, oh. and he runs out to her. This is all right here. He runs out to her and he goes, you're the girl I'm going to marry. Now, single guys in here, I do not recommend you doing that, okay? It's going to scare her off and it should scare her off, amen? Uh, but Jacob does it. He goes out there and then probably the most fascinating 
passage in the, well, no, there's a more fascinating one coming. But in verse 11, and once Jacob kind of does this, and they have this moment, and they're at the well, and Jacob then leans in after I'm going to marry you. You're the one for me. He leans in and kisses her. Now, this boy's moving fast, right? Okay, girls, a guy moves that fast, dump him right there, okay? Do not do that. But Jacob did, leans in, and then the most fascinating part in verse 11, it says, Jacob kissed Rachel and then raised his voice and wept. Okay, can I be honest with you? That's a little creepy, <laughs> right? I mean, here's this brother, sweaty palms, a little bit dirty, getting a drink. He leans into the love of his life and he kisses her and then cries like a baby. And you know, if you went on a date with a dude like that, he leans over and kisses you, you are not giving him a second date if he begins to cry, right? I mean, you know this, because, you know, you go home and you have this date with this dude and you get home and your parents or your roommates, they ask you, so how'd it go? Well, we went to Olive Garden, red sticks were great, and then, you know, lasagna and had this great time. Conversation was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, as the night went on, we were on our way home and, uh, man, it was going really well. And he leaned in and he kissed me and they were, oh man, really? What happened next? What happened next? Well, he cried. And I, I'm sitting there reading the story this week, and I'm going, I mean, what was Rachel doing? She's sitting there going, what in the world? I mean, this is a shepherdess, right? She's protecting sheep from bears and all these lions. And, all this. and, and here's Jacob, pretty boy, just sitting there crying. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's what you did in Israel in those days. I don't know. Anyway, he kissed her, went home. Goes to her dad, Laban. Tells her dad, look. This is the girl I'm going to marry. I want your daughter in marriage. Now, I like Laban. Being the dad of two daughters, I love the way he thinks. Because Laban goes, you know, you can marry my daughter, but you're going to work for me for seven years. And then you can have my daughter. I don't know about the rest of you dads in the room. I love that idea. Anybody else? Amen? Amen. I mean, the first hairy-legged boy that comes and wants to marry my daughter, you know what, bud, you can marry her, but you got to work for me for seven years first. I love it. <laughs> so, Jacob, he gets there, he thinks about it. Hmm. Hard labor. Seven years. Because, see, Laban didn't put him in the front office and director of marketing, right? He said, no, it's going to be hard labor in the field. So, Jacob thinks about it, and he goes, you know what? It's worth it. She's worth it. And so, he agrees to it. And here's where the story gets weird. He works for seven years and the day of the wedding comes. And so they had this big, long wedding. And in those days, the wedding didn't last like one day. It lasted seven days. And so he goes in and um, you can't make this stuff up, I'm telling you. Because he goes in, they get married, they enter into the um, um, honeymoon chamber room where they're going to consummate the whole deal. And uh, again, I'm trying to clean this up as best I can. They're going to have sex, okay? And so uh, they go into the room and um, Jacob realizes that he's married the lazy-eyed sister instead of Rachel. And um, instead of coming right back out, he just goes ahead and finishes the night with her. It's in there, I, I, anyway, all night long. Anyway, um, so he finishes the night, comes out the next morning, and he's mad. Wouldn't you? He's mad. Now, he just spent the whole night with her. I mean, he could have come out a lot sooner anyway, right? Okay, but anyway, man, that's just messed me up all week. If you're writing the Bible, you don't put this kind of stuff in there. But anyway, um, Jacob comes out, goes to Laban, and goes, dude, that was not our agreement. You know my agreement was I worked for you hard for seven years. And you would give me your daughter, Rachel. And Laban goes, I know, but I can't marry off my younger daughter without my older daughter being married first. It's not right. Because in that culture, the older daughter always marries before the younger ones. And so Laban says, listen, I, I got a great idea. Here's what I'll do. If you'll go ahead and finish out the week of wedding celebration so everybody thinks it's okay, and, and you'll go ahead and work for me for another seven years, I'll give you my daughter, Rachel. And Jacob weighs it in the balance, and he looks at it, and he goes, you know what? I'll do it. For the love of my life, 
she's worth it. Now that's a great love story. That's a notebook moment, you know? I don't know, some of you are scared to even admit you watch the notebook in, in church. But 14 years, seven years, the wrong one. And he says she's worth it. You know, when I met Danielle, it was similar to the story of Rachel when I went into that restaurant there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And as I walked in and the lights behind her head were glowing and I was looking at her going, oh, oh. And I had this moment where I looked at her and I'm gonna marry that woman. Not really, but I, I definitely wanted to know her. And so I, I kept going back to this restaurant over and over again and finally got up enough courage one day and I asked her if we could go on a date. And she said, no. <laughs> and she said, the reason is I'm on a year moratorium. Uh, I'm not dating anybody for a year. I'm working on my relationship with God and I'm 11 months into it. And so I can't date for another month. And so I had to wait a whole month to go out with this woman of my dreams. That wasn't seven years, but I had to wait a whole month and that's a long time. So basically, Jacob and I are about the same, amen? <laughs> no. Yeah, minus the skinny jeans, please. Um, anyway, um, you know what 14 years said to Rachel? Guys, listen to me, look at me. If you're single in this room, you're wanting to date, listen to me. Girls, don't take the first hairy-legged guy that comes along, listen to me. 14 years did and said to Rachel, Jacob put the effort in, he was intentional, he showed commitment, he worked hard. He put himself into a posture of working towards his relationship with Rachel. The habit of wanting his wife, Rachel. The whole idea that he pursued her. He loved her. He wanted her. And in fact, here's what he said by saying seven years and then I'll go ahead and finish the, the week out and, and then I'll work for your dad another seven years. Is that simply this, I'll work the rest of our lives for your love. I'm not going anywhere. I'll wait I will patiently long suffer for you. Now that is a love story. You see, we're not talking about what I would call a passive patience this morning. Because you see, some of you in this room are in relationships and it's easy for us to be patient in relationships when we've got someone that we're dating or we've got a friendship or we've got something going on where they're just, they've got a lot of drama and so you're thinking, man, I really like them, I really wanna be with them, so, so I'm just gonna let them work their stuff out because what we do is we take our relationship and we turn it into a circumstance and, and, and there's nothing wrong if that's where you are but that's not what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 13 kind of a love. You see, this whole idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is saying that we're going to have patient endurance towards people. Not just, you go work your stuff out, and when you're ready, you come back, and we'll, 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 we'll make our stuff work. No, it's us leaning in. It's us leaning in. It means like Jacob putting in the work towards a relationship, being willing to work towards building something that's healthy, that's healthy in our relationship. A couple of years ago, Springer, our, our boy, is now 11. He was nine years old, and he got this Lego set. And, and I, I, you know, when I bought Legos when I was a kid, they were so different than what Lego sets are today. Amen? Any, any of y'all built a Lego set lately? So he brings home this Lego set, and it's this ship and a bottle. I, and our Legos are like, you know, we built squares. But anyway, um, you know, ship in a bottle. And I'm like, holy cow. And I was like, dude, that's awesome, man. And so we set the card table up in the living room and, and, and he started opening the box and he poured the box out. And when we bought Legos, there was no books in the Lego box. This thing came with a book about that thick. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so, you know, it's like, this is crazy, man. And so really to kind of demonstrate to you what circumstantial patience is and what relational patience is, I had a choice that day. I could could have looked at my nine-year-old and said, son, you can figure this out. You, you've got this, man. So you just go to work and I'm going to watch you do this. And man, I'll sit here as long as it takes. You just work it out. And, 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 and man, I could just see if I did that, that maybe years down the road, it may be his wedding. I remember that time dad sat and just let me work through this. And, and it was just a moment that dad did that. I, I mean, it, it, it just stood back. No, 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 that's not what I did. 
Instead, what I did was, is I, I actually helped him build that thing. I didn't do it for him, but I entered into with him. And 11 hours later, amen? My back was hurting. I mean, we were just dying, man. We finally got it together. And it's like, oh, and it was awesome. In fact, I go into his room still and I look at it. And I'm like, that is so cool. See, there's a difference in circumstantial and relational patience. Because in relational patience, we're entering in together. You see, the takeaway for some of us in our relationships, and it doesn't matter if you're single, you're, you're, you're married, you're wanting to get married. For us in this room this morning, when we talk about circumstantial patience and relational patience, that maybe some of you today would say, you know what? I'm willing. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and work. And, and here's what that may look like for some of you. An honest conversation. You see, there's some of you in this room that your marriage and what it looks like on the outside is not even close to what it is on the inside. And the whole world looks at you and your area looks at you and they think everything's great. But the really truth is, is you've turned your marriage into a circumstance. And the most courageous thing you could do is go home and have an honest conversation. For others of you, it just means practicing compassion towards one another. There's some friendships in this room that are strained because you've turned it into a circumstance and maybe the bold thing for you to do is go home and, and practice compassion towards one another. If you're married, to maybe have more frequent date nights, amen? It might be that simple. It might even be courageous enough to get some counseling. Danielle and I go to counseling and we're not afraid of that. And we're also not afraid for you to know that. We haven't been in a while because we're in a really good season right now and we're grateful for that and we've worked hard for that. But we're not afraid that if we get into a bind, we'll jump right back into counseling because we know the value of somebody investing in us. See, whatever it may be, whatever it might look like in your relationship that you would say relationships are worth it, that there's something worth it, that I don't want a passive patience. And if you're single in this room, let me say this to you, because I know a lot of times we do relationship series, you'll, you'll go, ah, it's all for these marriage. Can I just say this to you? I, if you're single in this room, do what Kalea said and what Danielle was talking about when I first asked her out. Because see, both of those girls, Danielle and Kalea, here's what they did is, is they took that point and said, you know what? I'm not gonna invite God into my plan. I'm gonna enter into God's plan and I'm gonna spend the next year giving my pain, and all of my stuff and my plans to him. And I'm gonna work on my relationship with God. And I'll let God worry about that glorious moment when she comes across the desert or he shows up on the horse, amen? But I'm gonna focus on what God has for me because the world's gonna tell you to go and find somebody, find somebody, find somebody. Listen to me, teenagers. The world's gonna tell you, you gotta date, you gotta date, you gotta date, you gotta date, you don't. You can actually take a season. And for if, you're, if you're a teenager or you're a high school student or a college student, I would even say take the whole high school and take your whole college season and let God have that. And let God worry about bringing that person along. Amen? Give him your pain. Give him your plan. Because God's going to take both our pain and our plans. And I love what Kalei said is that he has his best intentions for us that we can trust him. And I know some of you don't trust him, but maybe you would be courageous enough today just to step into that and to trust him. Not in a passive way, but in an intentional way. You see, patient love in 1 Corinthians 13 is not passive, but I, I have to say this, it's also not permissive. And let me say this because I, you need to hear this. If you find that your patience in your relationship, if you're in a relationship that your patience is putting you in harm's way physically or sexually, listen to me. If you're listening to me on TV this week, you're listening to me in this room this week, listen to me, get out. Get out. If your patience is putting you in harm's way sexually or physically, get out. Get help, but get out. Don't stay there. And if you're in a place right now where you don't know you're struggling in that. In just a moment, we're going to have a response time and there'll be some elders and some guys up here and across the front and their wives and you're not real sure. We don't want you to do that alone. We don't want you to navigate that alone. So you come and let us help you. 
Because we, we want to help you in that. He said, we have a long-suffering God, and he refuses to suffer at a distance. He refuses to say, well, you're just working on out. He's in there with us. He sees our pain, our loneliness. He says, I'm not going to suffer at a distance. In fact, he demonstrated that, that to us 2,000 years ago as he sent Jesus and Jesus did the most incredible thing that anybody could do is he suffered with us. He suffered for us. He did what we're not willing or able that we cannot do for ourselves is that he took our sin on him and he died in our place. In other words, God entered into our pain. He entered into our suffering. He entered into us. Why? So that you and I could be in a relationship with him. Now that is a great love story. That's a great love story. So in closing, I want to show you one last passage. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, and Paul is uh, writing young Timothy. Timothy was pastor at a church there uh, in Ephesus, and so Paul is starting off this letter to him, telling him his story and talking about his story. And if you don't know anything about Paul, Paul wasn't a good guy. He went around persecuting Christians, went around all the time killing Christians, overseeing the killing of Christians, wanting to shut it down. And so he's telling his story when he comes to this verse 16 of chapter 1. And here's what he says. He's talking about God's patience. He's talking about how God suffered with him. This is the same guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And here's what he said. He said, I received mercy for this reason. For all the stuff I just told you, I received mercy for this reason so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Here's what Paul was saying. If God can do it for me, he can do it for you. Isn't that good? Paul saying, look, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. If God can do it for me and you know my past, he can surely do it for you. His ability to have patient love is a demonstration of his ability for every one of us. That God was patient with Paul extraordinarily patient with Paul. And he's waiting on us as well. He's waiting on us as well. And here's the good news. When God put on display through Jesus what a long-suffering, patient love looks like, here's what he's saying. Is that today, see, we've gotten to a point where we don't pray for patience anymore because we're scared God will give us an opportunity. No, 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 no. It's not up to us to be patient because Jesus has already done all the work for us. He's already done all the work for us on the cross. I mean, think about it. That Jesus does all the work. Why? Because we're worth it. I mean, think about Jacob and Rachel and all the, the effort that he put into Rachel's love. And God looks at our brokenness. He looks at our relationships. And he doesn't tell us, you know what? Get to work being patient. Go on, get to work, read more, serve more. Come on, work it up. Uh-uh. Jesus has already done it. Right where you are. Right in the moment. You're enough. And Jesus has already done the work for us. All we have to do in our brokenness, which by the way, we can't do anything about, right? You ever try to fix your own brokenness? How'd that work out? It's just be willing and ready to tap into that resource through the Holy Spirit of Jesus' patience. See, he didn't let us suffer alone. He sent Jesus. And so that we can be in a relationship with him in that active patience of him suffering with us. See, some of us haven't stopped long enough because the world says, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. And we hadn't stopped even long enough to understand that God is patiently loving you, inviting you to be a part of that. You see, when we receive that kind of patience from God, we can be that kind of patient in our own relationships, in our marriages, our friendships, our dating, our parenting. Mm, that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, our employers. That we can start to live out a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of patient love because it's not about your patience. In fact, I don't want this to be a self-help thing, but can you imagine if I looked at you today and said, here's what I'm going to do. I need you to muster up as much patience as you can. 
right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to close the service today. We're going to muster up patience. I don't know what that looks like, but anyway, you're going to muster up as much patience as you can so that when we leave this building, you're going to be patient people, right? How long do you think that'll last? If we could even do that, right? Some of you wouldn't even make it out of the aisle you're in because somebody sitting beside you won't get out of your way. And you sure aren't going to make it out of the parking lot, right? Because it's not about our patience. We don't muster up anything. It's on Jesus, a resource of the Holy Spirit that we might live out patience that's not ours anyway. And when we live out patience that's not ours, when we're tapping in in the same long-suffering patience of God towards us, when we live that out towards others, we are putting on display the Lord Jesus Christ for other people to see. And people will look at us and they'll ask, how in the world can you be that patient? Oh, I'm not. But God's been so extraordinarily patient with me. I can't help but put him on display towards others in my journey. And we get to display Christ. We get to be like Jesus. Isn't that good? We get to be like Jesus. And you see, over the next few minutes, I I know some of you are thinking right now, man, I need that. I need that in my relationships. I lead that in my life. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the band to come back uh, because I, I know some of you today, you're just, you're going, man, I need that. And it's not in a self-help book. You can read all the self-help books you want. It's only found in Jesus. It's only us realizing the long suffering of God towards us that we can then take that and put God on display in others. There may be some of you here this morning that needs that. So here's what I want to ask you to do. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And we're going to take communion as we do every week. Two tables in the front, two in the back. If you're saved and you have a relationship with God, we invite you to do that. But there's some of you in this room this morning because your friendships are strained, your marriages are strained, your relationships are strained. Just to be bold enough to honestly ask God for his patience. Would you? Just to take a minute this morning before you do anything, maybe before you take communion and just say, you know what, God, I need your patience because I'm not. I'm not. Give me your patience that I can put on display. Jesus. There's others of you here this morning. (laughs) You're testing God's patience. (laughs) You're testing him. And and see, I I would make the same challenge to you that I made to that other is that you would come to God and you would ask God for His patience. And I gotta be faithful here, I gotta be faithful. There's a part of God that if you continue to test God's patience in your sin, listen to me. It's God's not gonna force you. He's not that kind of a God. And we're grateful for that. But if you continue in your sin, then God will let that sin destroy you that your soul may be saved. And at any point if you're testing God's patience, you know what the remedy of that is? Repentance. Just admitting that you're a sinner and admitting that you need His forgiveness and coming to Him. He's long suffering for you. He loves you. That's why you're still here. You should have been dead long ago, amen? Yeah, you can laugh at that. You should have been dead a long time ago. God's long suffering. So if you're testing God this morning, the invitation's the same. That you would ask God for his patience this morning. Listen, I, I don't, I'm not standing up here telling you I've got this down. That, that whole part, love's not irritable. I can be a pretty irritable old man, amen? Anybody else in the room? Yeah, there's, see a hand back here, any up? No, anyway. Um, we work at this. We work at this. But you know what? I want real relationships. I want real relationships that we can grow together, that friends can grow together, and I can put on display the long-suffering of God. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I love you. Thank you this morning. Thank you for these great stories of Scripture. 
God, I pray this morning for that couple that sits here. And God, honestly, on the outside, they look perfect. I know the, the hollow feeling of that. Of everybody thinking you have this incredible marriage and at home it's, it's hollow. God, would you give them courage today? Give them courage today to step and maybe come to one of these elders and Father, ask for prayer or maybe even take that step towards counseling. Father, I pray for that single man or woman in this room today that God, just like Kalei, they're, they're doing what the world tells them to. Go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. God, would you give them courage today to bring their plan and their pain to you and trust you. And God, for that one that's testing you right now, oh, Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, God, that you're patient. Father, woo them, that they would be repent, they would repent, and they would turn from their sin and turn towards you. So Lord, I love you. Thank you that we get to worship you. Thank you that we get to take communion this morning. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said, let's stay. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.